Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, Professor and author Rory Cormack on secret intelligence and the British royal family. Queen Elizabeth II knew more state secrets than anybody, I reckon, who has ever walked the earth. Victoria, she was not only an intelligence chief in 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 a way, she was also an intelligence analyst. When the Prime Minister would bring her some materials, she would sit next to him and they would look at it and she would help him analyze. She knew the intricacies of European politics better than most people because they were her family. The, the Prime Minister at this point is asking to tap the phone of the monarch. And Vernon Kell, head of MI5, is aghast. He says, no, it is not MI5's job to be rummaging through the, the dirty knicker drawer of the British establishments. Rory, thanks for joining me on Chatter today. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. There's so many issues that I want to talk to you about, but we don't have 16 hours to record, uh, nor do our listeners perhaps have the patience for that. But let me just already uh, put out an offer to follow up with you one-on-one on some of these topics that we don't have time to explore fully in the recording. Um, I have you here today explicitly to talk about issues related to the British royal family and intelligence, that intersection that hasn't been explored as much as obviously the the government, prime ministers and, and intelligence, uh, or as much as intelligence perhaps in the United States when it comes to uh, head of state. But that's, it's, it's, it's a rich area and it's got so much fun stuff in it. You've already explored a lot of other intelligence topics in your research and writing career. So what is it that drew you to this area in the first place and then specifically got you focused on the crown? It was kind of accidental, really. Um, We were writing, my co-author, Richard Aldridge and I, were writing a a different book on prime ministers and intelligence, and we were charting the history of the relationship between 10 Downing Street um, all the way through uh, until, I can't remember where we stopped, it was back in 2016, and we've had a lot of prime ministers since then. Uh, That's right. (laughs) The the, um, the update will be difficult. (laughs) And then uh, there was this couple of paragraphs in one of the early chapters Around uh, around the abdication of Edward the Eighth back in 1936, and it was only I think it was literally two paragraphs where we'd said that Edward the Edward the Eighth was being spied on, and then we moved on because the book wasn't about the royals. And we afterwards we were thinking, hang on, this is a bit strange. We've got the monarch, the head of state, being spied on. Is this normal? Is this a thing? Um, how? Who gives the authorization here? Uh, what's 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 going on? And neither, you know, full full disclosure, neither Richard nor I are royal historians, royal experts by any stretch of the imagination. Um, we, as as you know, specialize in history of intelligence services. Um, but we thought this this is really intriguing, and we had uh, a bit of a dig and uncovered a bit more about Edward VIII and, and Wallace Simpson and, and 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 so on and so forth. Uh, and then we realised that the Queen was getting loads of intelligence, and we kind of assumed you know she'd see cabinet documents or whatever. But she's getting Joint Intelligence Committee weekly updates, copy number one, no less, of the Joint Intelligence Committee, which is the UK's all-source intelligence assessment body. Copy number one went to the Queen. And a bit bit more digging later, it transpires that Queen Elizabeth II knew more state secrets than anybody, I reckon, who has ever walked the earth. She was a human library of state secrets. She was being given material on a weekly, at least, basis for 70-odd years. Um, Really top secret stuff. Um, And so we went from there, really, and we wanted to know what did she receive? What did she do with it? Uh, And we went all the way back to to Queen Victoria because that was also so much fun. And I'm sure we'll get on to some of these in a bit more detail uh, later on. Um, But again, I'm, I'm not a Queen Victoria specialist, uh, it was my it was my task to, if you like, to to do the first draft of the Victoria chapters. 
there were only supposed to be you know, a couple, and there being four because she was just so interesting. So it was a labor of love. You know, we're not specialists in, in in the royals, but it was just it was just super interesting, and there was so much untapped material. It was great fun. There are so many fascinating stories here, and I do want to jump in to to many of them. But let's set the stage first for many of our listeners. Um, it has come to my attention over the years that a British education. You learn a lot about the history of the monarchy and the British government, whereas in the United States, it has always fascinated me that so many Americans are fascinated by the British royal family and yet know nothing before Queen Elizabeth II. That is, you just dropped, you know, well, Edward VIII's abdication in 1936 as if uh, everyone should know that. And yet there are some people who who think that they're watching things like you know, Charles and Diana and Elizabeth and the, the William and, and that's, you might as well be talking about the, the Tudors or William the Conqueror to them because they don't have that sense of history. Um, I would guess Queen Elizabeth I has some cultural memory in the United States, but even there, not as much as, you know, the, the bad King George that comes up in, when we take classes in the United States history of uh, the American Revolution. So, it's interesting to me that you have a different foundation just for the kind of the sense of time here from Victoria moving through the Edwards, the Georges to Elizabeth and now Charles, but there's a deeper history there too. And you've explored this previously also with uh, Queen Elizabeth and her intelligence apparatus. And it raises a big question for anyone in the United States in particular looking at this, which is, what is the actual constitutional role of the monarch when it comes to foreign policy and intelligence um, and relationship with you know, Her Majesty or His Majesty's government at any given time? What are the parameters of what the, the queen or now king can do? Very little formally. And you, know, you say we have a, a, a richer knowledge of our own history but to be honest all we study at school is a bit of tudors queen elizabeth the first henry the eighth and his many wives and then we fast forward to world war ii and that's the british history curriculum um, which you know which 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 left again richard and i as we're writing this thing learning like you know many of many of uh, our readers will be learning along with us um Mm -hmm. i had assumed wrongly that all the queen did was cut ribbons, shake hands, open parliament. Ceremony, ceremony, ceremony. Yeah, exactly. Read a speech that the government had written for her and would never dare to insert any of her own lines in there. That would be constitutionally wrong. Um, and so I'd always assumed that you know, this was the Queen's role. It, it obviously evolved over time, to put it in its wide historical context, in the Tudor era, the Queen did what she wanted to do. Uh, and she ran numerous uh, crazy intelligence um, in, in, intelligence organizations. Um, gradually, though, I mean, England's, of course, never had a revolution. We've still got our, our monarchy, apart from a, a brief period where we didn't. Um, and to make the monarchy move with the times, the Queen or King has become what's called a constitutional monarchy. They've shed their powers uh, of being able to uh, govern, essentially, they've given the powers to the elected prime minister, and then they just sit in the in the background. Queen Victoria was probably the last monarch um, who was really overtly meddling, and even she was a constitutional monarch, but she would she would lament it. Her diaries are wonderful as she's as she's whinging of an evening about having no powers, uh, and then you know her son has slightly less. And so on and so forth and, until Queen Elizabeth II um, was known for, for cutting ribbons and, and being a figurehead um, to, 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 to the nation, providing stability is the, is the official role. I think, I think she was very good at it. Um, but what we found was that there is a bit of a role that you're not going to know all of this stuff. You're not going to be a, a, a human library of state secrets, have all this knowledge and then not wield it somehow so she has no power she had no power king charles has no power but there's obviously influence there and we also know that constitutionally the monarch is allowed to advise encourage and warn her prime ministers and that's perfectly constitutionally okay she meets the prime minister once a week 
where she can advise, consult, and, uh, and encourage and warn. And mm-hmm. it, the intelligence is is part of her ammunition to in those conversations to say, "Have you thought of this?" She can't say do X or Y, but Queen Elizabeth was famous for raising an eyebrow inquisitively mm-hmm. and saying, "Is that wise?" Prime Minister. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, one thing I found fascinating is understanding, as you put it, having the ability to advise and encourage and consult with the Prime Minister, that Elizabeth shifted that somewhat and created an institution of her own doing of interpreting that not as being allowed to do it, but having a duty, a responsibility to do that. Um, I'm not sure if push came to shove, if uh, any particular prime minister would agree that 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 is required of of the monarch. But it is interesting in terms of carving out a role with very vague guidance constitutionally to to play a role that at least Elizabeth decided to to make that more of a responsibility of the crown itself. Yeah, and our constitution is obviously not written down, so it's vague. It's more open to interpretation. Not to say that a written constitution is uh, is not uh, <laughs> subject to interpretation or, or contestation. Um, but yeah, there, there's the prime ministers, monarchs, um, senior ministers, uh, the judiciary will con- are constantly arbitrating power, and you know who wields it, how it works. This is an evolving conversation if if you like and Mm -hmm. you know there are no real examples of of the queen overturning policy that would be a step too far but there are the odd occasion there's the odd occasion where you know a prime minister went into a meeting with the queen with one idea and came out with another idea um Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it it happens there's there's definitely influence there not power influence and in that relationship, it's it's fun to see the changes over time. You, you already talked a bit about uh, Queen Elizabeth I and the fact that she had, I think what you would call, um, especially compared with her immediate successors, a relatively robust relationship with intelligence. She had several spy chiefs. There are wonderful stories about Walsingham and others and, and what they did. But it it basically withered away after her for quite some time debunking this myth in the United States that honestly was very useful for British officials to exploit with Woodrow Wilson in World War I and with Franklin Roosevelt in World War II, creating this illusion that you know Great Britain had this long, illustrious, deep knowledge of intelligence and espionage operations, when in fact, after Elizabeth, it withered away until really the early 20th century in institutional form. Um, why why did it fade away after Elizabeth only to really resurface in the, the late 1800s and early 1900s? Because it was tied so closely to the the personality, the whims of the monarch at the time. And you know, Elizabeth was was, was on the throne for quite a while. She had um, numerous threats and Plots and conspiracies against her. This was a particularly turbulent, turbulent time with you know religious wars, uh, internal subversion, um, threat from Spain, and she yeah, felt armadas, the need. I mean, yeah, there were issues. There were right? there were lots of issues. So she felt the need to have a robust intelligence service. Um, but it's also a slight myth to look, kind of look back on it and think that there was this one modern intelligence bureaucracy under Elizabeth I, uh, because she actually had you know, three or four different favourites all running their own agents um, and kind of playing them off against each other in almost classic dictator style coup proofing. Um, and they're doing, they're running covert operations, they're running deception operations, they're doing kidnap and torture, all, all sorts of all sorts of things, and then. You're right. It it withers because successive monarchs, frankly, are are less interested in high politics. In um, you know, they, they they might have an intelligence chief, but that person would just be an enforcer, if you like, not an, an intelligence person. We you know, the way we think about it. Uh, and it wasn't until really Queen Victoria came to power that well, I think I've used that phrase again. Came to power, came to the throne um, that that the intelligence services started to be built up again. But even then, we're talking about special branch and 
the which is Britain's uh, uh, undercover political police force, if you like, and um, and even then, she had way better intelligence networks than the state. She had mm-hmm. uh, she had a she the head of a network of royal houses. Everyone she you know, her whole family was married to other people around Europe. As she had she had a, uh, you know, a webcast very, very widely. And she had much better intelligence than the government. And sometimes she would use that to support the government. Sometimes she would use that to undermine the government and um, get her own way. And mm-hmm. gradually throughout the throughout the, um, the 19th century, we see the formal intelligence machinery of states start to uh, grow because one, they realize they need to protect the monarch from assassinations. Um, this is, and two, because they realize that the monarch's intelligence is way better than state intelligence, and maybe we should be investing in some of this. I mean, it's not mm. until 1909 where the what became Britain's uh, intelligence services were actually formally created. So yeah, it's not this 500-year-long um, success story. There's also the other thing where you know, traditionally Britons didn't like spying and espionage. You know, the, the public were opposed to this. This right. surveillance was something that... Yeah, the Continentals did the despots in France. That was the that mm-hmm. was the attitude, um, which was even you know, even stayed until Victoria's time. But gradually, obviously, things have uh, things have shifted. Mm-hmm. There's a couple of issues in there I'd like to to explore a bit. You know, one one is just an observation that it is surprising to me looking at this just analytically that during the Napoleonic Wars, during a period of not not constant, but near constant repetitive threat. That's usually the time when a, a government will find an excuse to develop an intelligence apparatus. Um, it's happened more in modern times with a lot of countries, but it would have been easy to imagine the kinds of things like the development in 1909, you mentioned of the precursor to MI5 and MI6, to see something like that develop, you know, 100 years earlier. So it's, it's just interesting to me that it that it did not and perhaps that is a, a function of the the relationship of monarchs and governments and things of the time and the personalities involved as much as the external pressures. Um, the, the other one that I'd like to explore is what you said about Victoria and her use of her uh, extended family network to collect intelligence. Because that seems to me like that's a bit of a double-edged sword, and I'd like to get your take on this. On the one hand, She had trusted to her, trusted sources, in some cases, close family members who were married off and were literally reporting back to her what their husband, the ruler of another country or their cousin was saying, um, much better information than the foreign office, you know, was getting. On the other hand, this was no mystery. That is, you know, the the prince of, of this place or the king of this place, they knew that they married someone related to Queen Victoria, and they all assumed that they were reporting back on each other and giving intelligence, which having worked in intelligence makes me think, huh, that's that either diminishes the value of that intelligence to any intelligent person, and Queen Victoria, by all accounts, was at least intelligent, but it also presents a huge opportunity for misinformation and disinformation to, in a sense, pass things knowing that it would get back to Queen Victoria as manipulation of British policy. So I'd like to get your, your take on that, that Victoria, in a sense, set the stage for the modern relationship of the British government, the monarchy and intelligence, but yet it was based on this almost amateurish way of collecting information that was uh, pretty obvious to everyone. It was amateurish, and Victoria took advantage of this herself. From she was when she was schooled in the the, the arts of foreign policy as a as a teenager, she was taught how to do those kind of deception operations and, and feeding uh, misinformation to adversaries, knowing that they would open your mail. So therefore, you would write what you want them to know or what you want them what you want them to think. Um, so she was well aware of this, but at the same time, there does seem to be a bit of amateurishness and a bit of uh, a bit of naivety, because the the most prominent family member during this period was her daughter Vicky. Uh, uh, Vicky married the Crown Prince of Prussia, 
And so, as you mentioned, had a great, had a ringside seat to you know, the rise of Prussia, the rise of Bismarck, all of the various smallish wars that were going on in, in Europe at the time, and was providing lots and lots of intelligence back to her mother. I think what's interesting is intelligence for them was much, much broader than we might think of it now. So Vicky's letters back to her mother would include um, how the, her husband's feeling, how the, how the, how are the cats, um, get, what's the tittle-tattle between the, the, the servants or whatever. And then she'd throw in a line about Prussian mobilization on the border. Um, it was all, it was all very yeah. um, right. it was very it was the mixture of pri- personal and, and politics. I think was 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 quite striking. But it wasn't until you know a good few years of her doing this that Bismarck s- seemed to get wind of it, and then he did gradually freeze her out because she was, um, mm-hmm. to be fair, a, a spy for the English. Uh, and so she did right. get frozen out. But for a long time, she had access, and Bismarck let her get away with it. And even when he he found out, and you mentioned froze froze her out, that's a different reaction than you might expect today. When you could almost see people being arrested for treason, regardless of who they're related to, um, but back then it was just like, ah, shucks, you know, there there they go, you know, giving giving troop deployment and government decision information to a potential enemy in war. Um, okay, I, I guess we'll talk less. Um, it's such an interesting reaction compared to the. The cult of secrecy that's come up since then. Yeah, very much so, and also quite, you know, as we were saying a minute ago, quite naive because Bismarck could have launched a you know great deception operation back against against England. Um, he could have mm-hmm. he could have manipulated that channel. But what he what he did instead was gradually freeze her and the Crown Prince out of um, out of the discussions. He raided her desk quite mm-hmm. visibly. You know, one of those occasions. Um, where you, you come back to, the, to, your, to your office and you can see that the locks have been forced uh, to, mm-hmm. to, to send a message. And, and Britain ended up doing a, a bit of a document evacuation exercise, trying to exfiltrate this incriminating stuff out of, out of her castle, I think in a hat box at one point, mm-hmm. um, so that you know, they, could, they could get away with it. Um, but, but you're right, I mean, she was never... She was never arrested, despite years of, of leaking. But again, I think it's because there wasn't this sense of, of what's classified and what's not classified. You know, there was right. there aren't these laws aren't in place. There's no formal process of secret material and, and and public material, and it was all just very vague and very blurred back in those days. That's such a great point. You know, we're we're now we're so used to when we look at intelligence as as a historian or from a historical point of view we're now trained to look at institutions, right? In the United States, when was the National Security Act signed and what institutions, you know, have been legislated? And and that's not the way it was in the period we're talking about. It was much more of a informal master of whisperers kind of thing than a bureaucracy, certainly. Yeah, very much so. Let me pick up on, on something you mentioned a moment ago, I think referring to Elizabeth. You, you talked about a lot of the intelligence that she was developing having to do with coup proofing. And it takes me back to, you know, one of your books, um, How to Stage a Coup, which is a, a fascinating read. And it really informs, I think, the Victoria story as well is so much of what happened with her, especially later in her reign when the anarchists started you know, shooting, bombing, stabbing, or otherwise maiming and killing as many leaders around the world as they could get their hands on, um, that there there was a big push here that the threats to monarchs led to the growth of intelligence. In Elizabeth, it was her personality pushing it, but then with Victoria and afterwards, in many cases, it was the, the threats to monarchs, not to a, a prime minister or to the government itself, that that spurred the growth of intelligence institutions. Do I have that right? Yeah, and bear in mind that you know, these monarchs are her relatives as well. You know, this, is, this, is, this is her family that's being assassinated uh, by anarchists. Right. And even right. when it's not her direct family, it's still kind of you know, kinship of, of monarchs. They're in, the, they're in the same boat. And Victoria is constantly lobbying the prime minister 
uh, successive prime ministers to do something about this, that it's, it's not good enough, that there's no proper protection. Um, and the, the turn of the century, when the anarchist threat was at its, at its height, uh, there was um, you know, dis- discussions around intelligence sharing across the, across the continent, which was, which was an alien prospect uh, be- 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 before then. Um, and you know you can you can see the queen uh, in in the backgrounds and the margins uh, um, pushing for, for you know, trying to shape some of these diplomatic discussions because once again it comes back to this core point that for her it's both personal and political. This is her family. This is her life. This is her this is her dynasty, um, and as well as being the head of state and security. And I think that fundamental point around. The blurred line between the private and the public is what shapes a lot of the, the, the book and, and a lot of what I find so interesting. Um, and in fact, around British political life it, it itself, I mean, the argument that you know, you're not allowed to know about what goes, what the Queen's up to is because she's a you know, it's personal matters. Um, when actually a lot of it is diplomatic matters, and it's just it's that those blurred lines, I think, are are, are super important. Also, uh, if if I have it right, in Victoria's reign, at least it's the first uh, the first monarch that I'm familiar with starting to get the so called red boxes, um, and I think so called because at least at one point, maybe still they 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 were red. Um, these are the boxes delivered. Um, to to the palace with official papers. Now, in Victoria's era, that was largely government papers and uh, things of that sort, not technically secret intelligence documents because there was no such intelligence apparatus to classify something. Um, But Victoria was receiving what now we would consider secret information from the government, right? Yeah, she totally was. And the image of her sitting at her desk with a prime minister, um, she, she often did, poring over the latest secret material or in, you know, insights from a particular human source uh, on, on the continent. And she would actually be helping the prime minister to interpret some of these this intelligence. She was not only an intelligence um, you know, chief in a, in, a, in a way, she was also an intelligence analyst. She knew the intricacies of European politics better than most people because they were her family. And so when the prime minister would bring her some material saying a source in country X has told us that, she would sit next to him and they would look at it and she would help him analyse what it meant, what the implications of British policy were. And I just find that image just utterly uh, remarkable. She guarded that quite closely. Um, She wouldn't give a, a key, for example, to her husband, Prince Albert, um, until she got pregnant, and then gradually you know, she she couldn't um, keep on top as much as she wanted to when she was uh, very heavily pregnant, um, and she let him in more and more, and then they became quite a dynamic duo before uh, until he died. But initially, she guarded that that role um, very closely. An extension of this is the relationship of the government and intelligence regarding um, the man who would become Edward the Seventh. And I was surprised to learn that he had no access to secrets uh, as heir apparent. He had no access to secrets or even mundane matters of state that the the government just simply didn't trust him, which is horribly poor for for setting up for a good relationship once he has the crown. Um, talk a little bit about that. Talk about Edward the Seventh and and his relationship with with intelligence early in the 1900s yeah partly you've got you know, his mother's desire to keep things private um she didn't want to share too widely but the, the the bottom line is she like most others didn't trust him and she made it quite clear that there were other sons and indeed daughters that she would much prefer, preferred to be her uh, her heir um uh, but you know fate is what it is and he was going to be the going to be the king um, the problem was he was very open to blackmail. He would, as Prince of Wales, he would be cavorting around Parisian brothels um, with all sorts of 
people, um, potentially spies, agents for hostile parties. There was they were being followed by by undercover French police officers. There was all sort. There were all sorts of uh, problems, um, and her mother, his mother, could make some of them go away. But there were also you know, potential for uh, scandal, blackmail, uh, deception operations. Also, he was an intelligence liability. He was also a bit indiscreet. You know, he was a, he was a gossip. He'd have his big dinner parties where lots of wine and champagne and port was quaffed and they'd be you know banging on about the latest stuff and sometimes that would get back to his mother so it was for operational reasons if you like that he, he, he wasn't he wasn't trusted and then um gradually you know he he starts to get access to to some stuff not the not the juicy stuff and he gets re- really grumpy show me the good stuff he thinks you know there's the the the, the, the hidden gems somewhere and he's not being shown them show me the good stuff he, he shouts um at the at the, at the at the prime minister and even when he becomes king he's adamant that his mother had way more access than than he did which is probably true and he's adamant that his mother had way more influence than he did which again is probably true but largely because she was on the throne for half a century, and, and he hadn't. And you build up a lot more uh, when you when you're that experienced. Um, but he was he was quite he was quite grumpy. He felt hard mm-hmm. done by, and you know, gradually, he first of all he, he he developed his own private spheres. He followed his, his mother's route there. He, he started to pick out people in the military, people in mm-hmm. government who he was friends with, and they'd start to pick up you know, tidbits there, and. Uh, he did start to prove himself slowly around his relationships with um, Europeans, particularly the, the French. You know, he was fluent in French. He was a great Francophile. And some of his discreet diplomacy uh, was quite influential, I think, in, in, in setting some of the alliances before, before mm-hmm. World War I. But it certainly came from very unhappy starts where he, he wasn't trusted and he had no access. That's, that's so interesting because it parallels uh, in a, in a, in some sense, the experience with with his second son, who became uh, who became George V, that you know, starting out with not much in terms of expectations, but then growing into the role as it comes to intelligence and appreciating its role. I, I think you had a quote from from George from the early nineteen hundreds, where where he captured this well. He he was comparing German espionage, which he thought was masterfully organized and financed with with the british and and his quote was germans suspect that there are english spies everywhere yet we have no secret service funds or at least they are much smaller than any other state and our spies are the worst and clumsiest in the world um as a monarch that's a very damning statement and yet during the the first world war british did pretty well, pretty quickly from such a slow start. Um, talk a little bit about George's relationship with intelligence and how digging into the papers and the resources around him uh, gave you an impression of him as an intelligence consumer and operator. Well, I think there's there's often an assumption, maybe, that the the enemy is more omniscient than we than than than, than is actually the case, and I think that's maybe a a, a, a timeless issue around around intelligence, isn't it? You always assume that whether it's you know, Russia today or whoever, the Chinese today, you always assume that their intelligence services are bigger, more competent, and you know, uh, om, 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 omnipotent as well as omniscient. Uh, and I think George probably fell into that trap a little bit, thinking that the, the Germans were everywhere. There was, of course, at the time, a, a lot of hysteria around German intelligence uh, in the UK, there was this assumption that there was a German behind every Gooseberry Bush, that every waiter in London was a German spy, and mm-hmm. you had cry, you had spy writers making a small fortune churning out these um, spy thrillers, which they always claimed were informed by discussions with friends in government, but were always utterly ridiculous and sensationalist, uh, which whipped the public up into a fervour and was one of the reasons behind the the creation of. Um, um, what became MI5 and MI6 in, in the first place. So I think George falls into that trap a little bit of thinking that the, the, the Germans are amazing and the Germans are everywhere. But gradually, he becomes a quite a reasonably uh, astute 
consumer of intelligence. Again, he's being given lots of material. His biggest um, concern, I think, is a bit closer to home, though. He's, he's really worried about the rise of, of socialism um, in, the, in the UK and the rise of mm-hmm. uh, and the anti-monarchist sentiment that that you know, brings, ten, tended to bring with it, um, particularly in the aftermath of, of the Russian Revolution. And he's starting to gather intelligence with some of his advisors on the mood in the country, and he starts to get a bit more kind of domestic. Uh, domestic. Surveillance is the wrong word, but just keeping your ear to the ground, having your sources, telling you what's going on, telling you how the common man is feeling. Is what what are um, you know are the, are the Bolsheviks going to arrive in the UK? That was his big concern. And again, it's it's about self protection. And I think this is this is something we forget with 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 monarchs and intelligence. Is is this blurring of private and public? It's about maintaining his own family and potentially even his own life if there's ever going to be a revolution in the UK. Um, so he's particularly interested in that. When you bring up the, the the Bolsheviks and the Russian Revolution, I I have to get into to the story of Rasputin. So I, I remember reading stories as kids in these books of you know mysteries of the world and the unexplained. And I think in my mind, I still conflate Nostradamus and Rasputin because I think they were in one of those books together when I read them. So in my mind, I, the, the two of them are blurred. But what I remember from the sketch of him was, you know, totally creepy guy, um, had the the czar's wife under his, his influence um, for perhaps some good reasons having to do with uh, taking care of some, you know, some very sick relatives, but for also some ill reasons. But the thing that really stuck with me is the fact that the man wouldn't die, that there were attempts to kill him. And at least the way the myth goes is he, he was almost supernatural in his ability to avoid death at the hands of the many people who did not like his influence. But we know quite a bit more now about his death and there is an interesting United Kingdom intelligence uh, and crown awareness angle to this. So tell a little bit about the story of Rasputin's death and what, what you now think is the story of British involvement. Using the phrase we think, because it's still, to be honest, it's still, mm-hmm. there are still question marks and you've always got to be honest yeah. about what we, what we know, what we don't know, what we, what we think we know. And we think that there was there was some British complicity in, 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 in his death. We know that Rasputin died in December uh, 1916. Um, mm-hmm. We also, well, the story goes that, that he was poisoned um, by, a, by a prince. Um, um, but... There are certain things in the story which don't seem to add up, and we know that MI6 had a bunch of uh, of officers uh, and just kind of informal contacts knocking around uh, Russia at the time. Um, and it seems that that the that Rasputin didn't actually uh, ingest any poison on on that night, um, but. There were some bullet wounds from um, more than one revolver, which is what the what the autopsy uh, found, um, including a, a, a shot right to the forehead. Um, so something didn't quite add up. What we learned was that sh- there was one person who did see Rasputin's decomposing body, and it wasn't a Russian. It had just happened to be a guy called Sam Hoare, who was the lead MI6 man uh, on, on the ground. And so we mm-hmm. think that, I mean, it's all circumstantial, but we think that the, you know, the, the famous poison narrative is just, is, is, is just a story. Perhaps even, mm-hmm. um, it's where it gets, gets slightly more interesting, that it could even be a deception operation or you know, a, con- you know, a constructed narrative done mm-hmm. by another uh, MI6 man who was um, writing up some of this, some of the stuff in a, in a report. Um, so it's, it's circumstantial, but there are British MI6 people placed, you know, at the, 
out of a scene of the crime and some of the official stories just just don't add up so you know richard and i right. uh we're, we think that mi6 were, were were complicit in this right right well george george v of of course king at the time um but he died in if i remember right 1936 and the uh <laughs> the the troublesome edward the the eighth is 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 coming in and uh I think you noted that his his father George had 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 noted some ten years earlier that he thought that Edward would end up abdicating, which of course he did within a year. Absolutely fascinating to learn, as you mentioned when we started, that he was under surveillance. the The heir apparent was literally under surveillance, and then as king, was being very closely watched because of some of his issues when it came to trust and security. Uh, walk through those basic issues for the people who aren't familiar with the story and how it affected his relationship with intelligence. There was clearly something about the, the role of Prince of Wales because Victoria's son, Edward VII, that we discussed, was, was Prince of Wales and suffered the same fate. And then suddenly, Edward VIII, as he would become, as was, was Prince of Wales and was also fabulously indiscreet, um, was a womanizer uh, he also um was, was sleeping around and opened himself up to to various um accusations of blackmail i think at one point he was blackmailed but the government managed to make it go away as government as governments um used to be able to do and you know, they managed to keep, keep keep one of his indiscretions out of a court case but one of his lovers got uh, got shot to death by by her husband, I think, uh, and the government scrambled yeah. desperately to keep his name out of the papers. Uh, so you, this again is not someone you want necessarily trusted with uh, with, with with intelligence. And it starts out as a surveillance operation requested by the king. It's quite low level. It's special branch undercover following his movements because the the, the king is. Is worried that he might be being blackmailed. You know, he's, he's, he leads an exotic, uh, exotic social life. Um, we know that he just bought a, you know, a mystery woman some very expensive diamond necklaces, and, and the, the king's worrying about about the monarchy, the, din- the, the dynasty. This isn't security. It's not about Nazis and all that kind of stuff yet. It's about we need to know what Edward's up to um, and, and if he's going to cause a scandal, a political scandal, a family scandal. Uh, so he, the king and the prime minister, authorised Special Branch to, to follow. To, to, uh, they, they learn that, um, that Edward is having an affair with a married woman, famously the American divorcee Wallace Simpson. Um, and then they learn that Wallace Simpson is also having another, another affair. So they're following her, trying to work out who she's sleeping with worrying it might be a nazi and this is where the stakes start to start to get a bit uh, more serious Uh, but they're relieved to learn that it wasn't uh, the nazi ambassador to the uk it was actually uh, a second-hand car salesman by 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 (laughs) a guy trundle who the police that's actually an improvement yeah (laughs) exactly he was apparently a very good dancer according to the surveillance uh, officers but she was she was having contact with um with the the nazi ambassador at ribbentrop um and we see this this gradually ramp up. MI5 become a bit concerned. The, the upper echelons of MI5 become a bit concerned. The, the police are happy to do this. Um, but mm-hmm. once the surveillance gets ramped up and, and they start talking about uh, tapping phones and that kind of thing, that's, that's now MI5 territory. And that's serious. That's a serious mm-hmm. uh, request. We know that... The head of MI5, Vernon Kell, said, "No, good goodness me, no! I'm, I'm not. Uh, this is sorry. I should, I should add. This is after um, King George had died and Edward had become the king, which ramps it up even more. So the the um, the, the prime minister at this point is asking to tap the phone of the monarch, and this is a is a huge deal. Uh, and Vernon Kell, head of MI5." Is a ghast. He says, "No, it is not MI5's job to be." I paraphrase, rummaging through the the dirty knicker drawer of the British establishments. You know, that, mm. this is personal affairs. 
Um, I don't care who he's sleeping with. This is an inappropriate use of intelligence. But he actually gets convinced by his by his board of deputies because they argue there is a serious security um, point around this. First of all, is the the worries about um, the, the impending the impending abdication. He's he has uh, insisted that he will marry Mrs. Simpson no matter what. Um, this raises constitutional issues. It raises potential security issues because there's still question mark or what question marks about his and her um, affection towards German and Italian fascism, um, mm-hmm. and it also raises concerns about the potential that a uh, potential of King Edward dismissing the government and there being a, some sort of right wing coup, bringing in what was yeah. then called the King's Party, um, mm-hmm. protests, civil unrest. So. Bernard Kerr and my five think, okay, this this is security. This is this is serious. And he authorizes um, a guy called called Tom Robertson, my five officer, who sneaks into Green Park in London behind the palace in the dead of night, puts a, a tap on the on the phone junction, and is able to listen in to calls being made. Uh, from the king himself to Wallace Simpson, and also from the king himself to his younger brother, who would soon become George VI, uh, and, is, and is feeding all this back to, to the prime minister. It's a quite remarkable episode of prime ministers and MI5 tapping the phones of the palace. It's absolutely stunning. And then the, the details you've, you've researched are just so, so rich here, but it, it doesn't change the fact that it's jaw-dropping. Um, plus, I will add, as somebody who's fascinated with the intelligence briefings side of things, the fact that the famous red boxes, they, they continued to go to Edward VIII despite these concerns, despite the monitoring that was going on. But there's some concern there too, because some of those red boxes were uh, not returned for weeks on end. And I believe in some cases they were even lost, which perhaps they were not giving him the most sensitive secrets. But even then, any state papers being lost is not a good thing. Well, can you can you imagine? There was one one night after one of his famous debauchery uh, debauch parties in, uh, in in his luxury Fort Belvedere, um, where he said to I think it was the American attaché or some American citizen. Uh, by the way, are you uh, are you heading back via Downing Street? Can you can you carry this box of classified documents back and just drop it off? If you're going back by Downing Street, just drop it off for me. And the, oh. the American just couldn't couldn't believe it. Uh, and when when um, when the British government learns of this, as you can imagine, they are they are horrified. They're also getting documents back with um, with cup stains or with wine glass stains on them on these documents. I mean, it's a staggering breach mm. of breach of security. Uh, so gradually, you know, he gets given uh, slightly less stuff for for, for very right. good reason. Now, after after his abdication with with George the Sixth, he he also received these these red boxes and got the the intelligence information. Um, but I think the process improved a bit because my understanding is that he he got the secrets, but they were they were delivered to him, and the person delivering them would would wait in the room or outside the room and then secure the materials and make sure that, that they were not roaming around. So I think there, there was some institutional lesson learned there, right? There was, because at the end of the day, he was his brother's brother. And mm-hmm. uh, George VI, I mean, we forget this today. He's remembered, at least in the UK, as the, as, as the war monarch, as the, yep. the, the, yep. the wartime leader who saw us through Britain's darkest days. Uh, mm-hmm. Which you know, he, he eventually did, but we f- we forget that early on in the war, before the war, you know, he was an archer Pisa. He was mm-hmm. on Neville Chamberlain's side when Chamberlain signed the the famous deal at Munich with with Hitler. Who's on the phone straight away as Chamberlain's plane lands? It's George the Sixth. He wants mm-hmm. Chamberlain to come straight to the palace. Man of peace wants photo ops. You know, he is he he's. he's He's not a Nazi. He has no Nazi affiliations um, or sympathies, unlike his his brother, who I think did have some uh, affection uh, for all of that. But he was still an Archer Pisa. And so given the scandals or worries around his brother, 
given the fact that he's also an arch appeaser, but for very different reasons, I, we should explicitly state, um, the intelligence services don't quite trust him. And he has to earn back that trust. So it starts off, as you say, in very carefully controlled briefings um, where people are st- standing over him. He reads them, gives them back. But gradually, as the war progresses, he does earn um, the, the trust. And then he gets uh, brought in to every secret in the land, yeah, even the most sensitive um, stuff around special operations executive and the sabotage behind enemy lines, behind uh, Bletchley Park, all of the um, interceptor material there, and yeah, even the most sensitive stuff around D-Day, in which he even had a role yeah. himself. Yeah, I want to talk about that because it is, I mean, one of the most fascinating, if not the most fascinating story of uh, from the grand level of deception to the very tactical level um, and the documentation that's come out about Operation Bodyguard writ large, but especially Operations Fortitude North and South. Um, I had not been aware that the king had an operational role here. Um, what are What are a couple of the things he did to help bolster the notion of these uh, false invasion fronts to try to reinforce the German belief that the the main invasion was not coming to Normandy. I love this. It's the it's the journey of, of King George. He starts off being not particularly well trusted and suddenly he's playing an operational role. And we know this because I think it was someone's diary, I think it was his private secretary's diary, has a brief line about um, MI5 came to visit the palace to update the king on there, and we thought, what? Hang on. Okay, so he knows about it. Um, and then it turned out what he was doing, or what MI5 asked him to do, to, and I quote, bamboozle the Germans, uh, was to make sure, or to, was, was to carefully plan his visits to different army bases up and down the country in such a way that would give the impression that the invasion was coming to Calais rather than Normandy. So go and visit those those um, those bases on the east coast, uh, closer to Dover for, to make that to make that journey. MI five and the king knew full well that his movements were almost like a highlighter pen for the Nazis, and and Hitler um, lived under a kind of mis- misperception or an outdated perception. That the royals were incredibly important politically in all this in all this kind of all this kind of um, stuff planning. Um, and so he, they knew that Hitler would be watching where George went and would draw conclusions from that. Um, and this tied up with the the deception operations, the double agents, the, all the, all this kind of thing was just one piece in that puzzle um, to make Hitler think the invasion was going to come from the wrong place. He even you know, took one very dangerous trip to be fair to him around Fortitude North which was the deception op- deception operation to make the Germans think that there would be an invasion of Norway and so what he did he went up to very small islands right up off the north coast of Scotland in the middle of the North Sea where there are all sorts of submarines and enemies all over the shop and um, knowing that the media would report this knowing that Hitler would see this and think, oh my goodness, the king's taken a risky mission up to these islands in the middle of the North Sea. Um, there must be something going on up there. And uh, and there wasn't. It was all part of a, of, a, of, a, of a deception. And George knew what he was doing, and he loved it. He absolutely loved being involved. He loved the secrets. Um, he, he loved playing a role. It was, uh, it's, it's, it's just such a, such a wonderful story. It's hard to psychoanalyze anyone from afar, but I think particularly somebody that we're talking about now, what, 80 years in the past. But you have to wonder if if some of that, you know, interest in playing an operational role and loving it came from him reflecting and saying, wow, was I wrong before the war? And now I can, in a, in a sense, you know, I can, I can refresh the public memory of that. Maybe I can, you know, push down my own self-loathing over some of the things I did. Maybe that's too strong, but it seems to me that there's there's some aspect that certainly comes out of the story of him redeeming himself for some of his previous mistakes of judgment. That's why I like the the, the George stuff. It's it, there's a there's a there's a Hollywood narrative arc going on. There there is a story yeah. of you know of, of, of redemption, and I 
I love that. But I also think, you know, at a more basic level, he loves secrets. He loves spies. He loves stories. He loved exploding, mm -hmm. exploding horse poo, um, which was <laughs> stuff that he was being shown in the um, in an exhibition of sabotage uh, paraphernalia. Uh, he was, I think, he was supposed to be there for about forty five minutes. But he and his wife, uh, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, um, were mm -hmm. there for about an hour and a half, looking at exploding horse droppings, exploding wine mm -hmm. bottles, exploding dead rats. He just, you know, yeah. at a basic level, like so many people right. around the world, just found it yeah. fascinating. Well, George, during the war, it became a very avid reader of the intelligence that he was provided. So it's not that surprising that when Elizabeth um, took the crown less than 10 years later, uh, she was also a fastidious reader of intelligence. And you have documentation for the fact that, yes, she was receiving uh, a lot of secret information, including that number one copy of the intelligence report from early in her reign. And, uh, you know, highlighting things uh, with, with pencil, not taking a lot of notes, but certainly paying attention to the material and then using it in her conversations with prime ministers. So on that side of it, I, I think... There's, there's a good track record for some, what, 60 plus years, 70 years of, of Queen Elizabeth um, in, incorporating intelligence into her strategic thinking in order to play that advisory role to various governments. Uh, but there's another side to the crown in intelligence in her reign that's, that's a little more disturbing. And you've studied this case closely. And this is a, a close friend of her mother, uh, someone who had worked for MI5 during the war ultimately took a position as the surveyor of King's pictures, essentially a art historian for, for the royal family. Um, but Anthony Blunt was also a Soviet spy, and Elizabeth knew it. So tell us that story and, and how that developed and reveals so much about this relationship between the family, the government, and intelligence. It's another one of these just fascinating intrigues that we see all, all throughout this, this period, really. And you're right, Anthony Blunt was the, the, the royal art historian. Essentially, he worked for her father. He worked for her. Um, he'd worked for MI5 during the, the Second World War, um, but was also a Soviet spy. And the official narrative, he was outed, I think, in 1979, 80-ish, um, and died shortly afterwards. It was one of the, the famous Cambridge Five. One, the, um, the standard narrative was always, yes, he was a Soviet spy. He stopped in 1945. Might have had a couple of, um, couple of contacts still going on, but certainly um, by the early 1950s, you know, he was done. He was working in the palace, um, and uh, let's, all, let's all move on with our lives. Um, but what we found, looking at some of the very recently declassified archives, was that he carried on being in touch with um, Soviet intelligence. Um, and after MI5, after he confessed to MI5 in 1964, he continued to work with MI5 um, afterwards. So you you essentially have not a, an innocent, well, not innocent, but a you know a once guilty now reformed intelligent uh, art historian working in the palace. You've actually got an, you know, an intelligence asset, an active intelligence asset at play in uh, <laughs> in, in the, the Queen's household. Um, wow, this isn't isn't history, and it was always portrayed from the. But in 1964, he confessed, and it was all ancient history. We found no, it wasn't. Um, his phone was bugged all the way through. Um, successive home secretaries agreed to bug his phone all the way through. Now, who knows what that would pick up? Um, you know, I can only speculate, but conversations with, with members of the royal family would be listened into by, by MI5. And um, yes, yeah, so that's another the other question then is, did, did the Queen know? And, and how much did the Queen know? Blunt confessed in 1964 after numerous interrogations by by mi5 um and the queen knew is the is the is, is is the bottom line she was briefed um pretty much straight away and and she knew uh, they apparently kept a distance 
uh, after that, as as you would. Um, but occasionally, you know, Prince Philip would bump into him in the in the corridors as as Blunt was taking people on tours of the artwork of the palace. Um, they, you know, their, 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 their paths their paths crossed, but he carried on working there whilst also being an active uh, informant, I suppose, for, for MI5 um, way after 1964 with the Queen's knowledge. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. And, and it speaks to your larger point that uh, Queen Elizabeth almost certainly had a better, deeper, richer understanding of intelligence over a longer period of time than anyone else alive near the end of her reign, simply because she'd seen it all. She'd been through it all. She'd had that experience um, and and many others, ranging from attacks on members of her family um, to her own role, in a sense, using the intelligence when she was, I'll put it this way, even though it's probably uh, out of order, when she was deployed diplomatically. When in conversations with the government, you know, she said, I want to travel to this place. And they said, yeah, if you do, be careful about this. Or in some cases, it almost seemed like the government would say, hey, it would kind of be useful if you traveled here and played this role. And there's no doubt that the intelligence helped her to do that, if not directly, certainly by giving her situational awareness and letting her know what some of those sensitive issues were so that she could, in a sense, help the government and and do no harm while abroad. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you two two quick examples. Which I think are quite quite interesting stories. The first one was she was deployed in the mid nineteen fifties uh, by the Foreign Office. And I think, to be honest, I think deployed is a is a fair word. Um, there was a particular Iraqi princess who had been saying mean things about about Britain. And she was very, she was very young. She, she married into the, the Iraqi royal family, uh, Iraq being a, a core ally of Britain and a way for Britain to extend its influence across the Middle East at the time, a very, very important country for the, for the UK. And she had been saying nasty things. So the Foreign Office came to the Queen and said, look, would you mind discreetly taking her under your wing? Would you mind mm-hmm. meeting her at Ascot, showing her a good time, have a cup of tea with her, and just gradually um, gradually influence her, gradually help her see that, that Britain is, is, is good and benevolent and, and, and for her to stop uh, <laughs> slagging us off, basically. And the, the Queen did it. You know, she quietly uh, acted as a, and now I'm going to use a, use a phrase, as an agent of influence. With, with, with this sure, with this Iraqi sure. princess, um, they met at Windsor. They met after Ascot, uh, and you know, she 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 worked her worked her charm. Unfortunately, on this for this on this occasion, it was uh, fruitless because the uh, the Iraqi Revolution happened very shortly afterwards, and um, the monarchy yeah. was 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 no more. But there's a there's a clear example of her being deployed. And I'll give you another mm-hmm. another quick example, if I may. We fast forward um, fifteen years or so, and there's talk about the queen going to visit somewhere behind the the iron curtain she's a bit mm, right she's a bit uh not entirely happy this you know her, some of her relatives was were, 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 were murdered by the by the russians um as part of the during, during their revolution and it's not ancient history for her um but you know there 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 are, there are talks the russians want her to come um and i think it was harold wilson the labor prime minister he well, how can I use her here? Because the Russians had just arrested a British teacher for spying, uh, for working for MI6, and he was being treated badly in a in a labour camp. We wanted him back. Um, we were gonna, we were going to swap him for um, some Russian spies, but that that fell through. And so Wilson thought, can I dangle? A royal visit in return for a spy swap, uh, kind of a royal spy swap, if you like. And she was up for it. He had a very discreet meeting with her, uh, he, and she said, "Look, as long as it's really oblique, as long as you're not obviously using me as a Cold War pawn, then that's okay." And again, that ultimately didn't come to pass because of the uh, Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia um, and diplomatic relations tanked 
Um, but Prince Philip did end up having a, a quite important trip, right? Wasn't it? If I recall right, it was a uh, based around some equestrian event, but it basically allowed that door to be open for that channel of influence. Yeah, so the, the the queen couldn't end up being deployed, even though she was willing to do it. So they then work down so how the British hierarchy works. You work down the royal family, and uh, and Philip was was up for it. He did it as part of the the yeah the international um, equestrian association. I think I think he was head of at the time, and it just creates this this wonderful constitutionally blurry zone where he's going not as Prince Philip, not as the Queen's, not not as the husband of the head of state, but he's going as the head of the International Equestrian Association or whatever it was called. And it, again, you get this, the, the, we're taking advantage of the blurring between the public and the private and it allows him to go over there. He gets a, a tour. He visits, um, I, I think he visited St. Petersburg, very heavy-handed KGB presence, as you can imagine, Soviet propaganda is running overdrive to try and um, to try and uh, spin certain narratives. Um, I think on one occasion he managed, he managed to he managed to escape from them and he was quite pleased with himself. He managed to he managed to evade uh, his, uh, his his KGB minders to go and have a little look around somewhere. Um, but yeah, he, he he managed to he managed to go out there and it was a, a diplomatic coup, even though technically mm-hmm. it wasn't diplomacy. Right. There are so many, so many stories about uh, Queen Elizabeth and intelligence that you you could have written a book just about that. Um, but I'm not going to steal all your thunder. Instead, I will refer people to to the new book you've written with Richard Aldrich, Crown, Cloak and Dagger, which has stories, of course, about Queen Elizabeth, but uh, everyone else we've we've talked about as well. But I, I do want to close with two gentlemen um, that we haven't discussed yet. And one of them is Charles um, I still, in my mind, think Prince Charles, and that'll be hard to get over. But Charles the Third. So do I. Uh, it's, I. I imagine it's it's hard for anybody because living memory, there aren't too many people who uh, didn't have decades upon decades upon decades of a Prince Charles rolling off their tongue. Um, so first him, and then we'll get to to his son. So we know relatively less about Charles and his his use of intelligence now and how he receives it and his reaction and even his interactions with intelligence um, than we do in some cases. And that points to an issue of research I wanted to ask you about. It's hard enough, uh, as I've learned, researching official government records having to do with intelligence because of the sensitive nature of the material and some variances. And that's true in the UK as well as in the US. Researching the royals is even harder. Um, why is that? And how did you still get some of these amazing stories? It is ridiculously hard um, to do this. And like you, I come from an intelligence history background, and we have our challenges in that, in that world. Um, but honestly, the royal family make MI6 look like WikiLeaks in comparison. It's just, <laughs> it's just crazy. They are exempt from um, declassifications. They're exempt from Freedom Information Act. All their papers are locked away inside Windsor Castle. Um, anything to do with the Queen is classified. Anything to do with her husband, sorry, with her father is classified. Anything to do with Edward VIII is classified. And the, the National Archives in, in London are a, they're a barren wasteland of of, um, of material. And I'll give you a, a quick example. I mean, the, the 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 Queen has this weekly meeting with Prime Ministers, and I found I, f- I found in um, in the archives a file saying Queen's meetings with Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. And I did my little archive dance. I was so excited. I thought, Oh my goodness, have, have they missed something? Is there is there something in here? And I opened it up, and it was one slip of paper. And it was the prime minister's secretary writing to the queen's secretary saying, hmm. uh, would you mind if the prime minister wears formal tails instead of a dinner suit tonight? <laughs> and that was that. So how did we, how did we get these, these stories? Um, a few ways. First, coming to your side of the pond, um, the American archives, whether it's intelligence or indeed royals, are more open than, than ours. And we found some of the some of the juiciest material was actually in in American archives. We also used uh, private papers um, where 
something might have been overlooked by a government weeder. I think one of my favorite stories from the whole book came from the private papers of a guy called Evelyn Shukra, who was the chief diplomat in the uh, specializing in the Middle East in the 1950s. And he'd written a book called Descent into Suez, and it was, it was his memoirs of 1956. Uh, there is no mention of the Queen in the published version. But being the intrepid, nerdy historian that I am, I went to the private papers, I went to his actual diary and went through it. And in there, I saw a, um, a record from July 1955, I think it was, where he's describing a meeting with the Queen. He's saying, I, I went to the palace I saw the Queen, and we were um, and we were discussing a particular Middle Eastern leader who we didn't like, and we we're talking about covert operations. And the Queen looked at me, and the Queen said to me, "Has nobody thought of slipping something in his coffee?" And you could, and Shukra's reaction is uh, is wow. one of shock. But I mean, that's that's an example of stuff that's available. But you've got to really, really hunt for it. Wow. That's amazing that that did slip by whatever minders would would review the publication of that because it, it does stand out so much compared to other material that's available. Um, finally, uh, William, um, we do know that uh, Prince William did spend several weeks full time seconded in a sense to MI6, MI5 and GCHQ. So at least... He's had some hands-on exposure, and he made some comments afterwards about, you know, really now understanding what the Secret Services do and appreciating the sacrifices they make. That seems to be a good sign for the future in terms of his appreciation of intelligence, but correct me if I'm wrong, we, we don't have any sense of whether he is getting red boxes and whether he is reading secret materials other than that to which he was exposed while on those visits. Yeah, we don't, we don't know. I assume he's... I'm assuming he's not um, getting really mm. secret stuff. Yeah. It gets to this, this, this point of the, the, the closeness between the intelligence world and the, and the royals. They, they, ever since Queen Victoria, have been, have been intertwined. And Charles was, and I think remains as king, uh, the patron of the intelligence services. And he's meet, he, he meets intelligence chiefs regularly. He met them as, as, yep. as prince. He's been doing it now. Um, he gave out awards, secret awards, um, to intelligence officers who had gone above and beyond. Um, one would assume William at some point might inherit that particular role. So they're clearly very interested in the secret world. They clearly have a, mm. an appreciation of, of the secret world. And if they're receiving material, I think that's a good thing because you know, as, as you've written about, you don't want a, a consumer who's receiving stuff but doesn't understand the strengths, weaknesses, limitations of um, what intelligence can achieve. Right. Well, it is our tradition to end our conversations with a uh, random question from our chatterbox. So let me reach in. Rory, please name one dead political or national security related leader from any era that we could really use right now. Who's someone in all of this historical research that stands out as somebody who would have some really good insights to apply today? Oh, that's a that's a good a good question. I would probably choose um, sticking with my theme from British history. Nice. Let's go with Clement Attlee. Clement Attlee wow. post post war. That's not the first thing that came to my mind. Please explain why. <laughs> uh, there there are a few other prime ministers that I might have guessed first. So tell me why Attlee came to mind. Post war prime minister, um, and I think we could do with him because grown-up approach, serious, pragmatic, deeply respected the work of intelligence, uh, more than people, I think, realize, did, uh, did a lot of things around um, count countering Soviet uh, influence operations, countering Soviet uh, covert operations. He launched some of Britain's first uh, Cold War covert actions, but he did so in a in a measured way with the bureaucracy behind him and everything. You know, all of his ducks were in a row, and I think that that kind of thing is is I think is really important. You've got somebody who is is measured, is careful, is is quite cautious, but also recognised the um, the importance of, of this and the role that it that it that it can play. Uh, and I think those two things right now 
would be quite useful. Not not to put words in your mouth, Rory, but it sure sounds like you're saying that uh, having someone that competent without a lot of drama associated with it um, would be a nice antidote to some recent dramas involving 10 Downing Street. Um, not not your words, but maybe the idea underlying it. I, I, I think that's fair. <laughs> well, um, I, I really appreciate you chatting with me about all of these stories. And again, I'll refer people to all of your research and writing, but most, most notably and most recently is Crown, Cloak and Dagger about the relationship between British royals in the modern era and, and intelligence. Um, thanks for coming on. Thanks so much. I enjoyed that. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Chatter.